And as a reminder, as we're going through this series on how do we know it's true, we're talking about evidence. And we're putting together six weeks worth of evidence that the story of Jesus is true. And we remember that if somebody says, well, prove it, scientifically, something has to be repeated in a lab to be proven. So you can't repeat Jesus' life in a lab in the same way we can't repeat Thomas Jefferson or Napoleon. But there's evidence, strong evidence, that all of them existed and continue to affect our lives. But in terms of today, we're talking about bi biographies, and I thought of a story about this um, guy. He had, you know, just didn't believe in God, and he was out fishing. He didn't believe there was a God. He was out fishing in Scotland. And all of a sudden, a huge dragon-like serpent came out of the water with snarling teeth that moved closer to the guy in the boat, and the person shouted then in desperation, Dear God, please save me. All of a sudden, the creature went back beneath the water, and a loud voice in the sky said, This is God. I saved you. I thought you didn't believe in me. And the person said, Please just give me a couple minutes to catch up. I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster two minutes ago. <laughs> now, we continue the six-week worship series on how we know the story of Jesus is true based on evidence. How we have evidence, it is real, and Jesus is real, and Jesus really rose from the dead. We're not taking it on blind faith. Even though faith is important, we still have evidence. And so today, the evidence we're discussing is the many biographies and other writings about Jesus. On your first sermon note, early sources... Now, when I talk about early sources, I'm really talking the first 50 or so plus, maybe 50 to 100 years, early sources mention Jesus and early Christians far more than other people we accept existed. This is what I mean by that. We take it for granted that people like Socrates, the great philosopher, existed. But do you know that we have none of Socrates' writings? He was only mentioned by two of his students, Plato and Xenophon, and there was also a playwright that made fun of him briefly named Aristophanes. That's it. Three people, and we accept without a doubt that Socrates was real. Many more sources exist outside of the Bible that tell about Jesus' life. We know of 17 sources, 17 outside the Bible, that mention Jesus in early Christianity that were written shortly thereafter. For example, Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor. In 112 AD, he wrote to Emperor Trajan for advice. He said to the emperor, how do I persecute these Christians more effectively? So obviously, he wasn't a fan of us. And he explained, he, this is how he described Christians, which it actually, as he describes it, I wonder, why did he have a problem with them? He says, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. He said ordinary and innocent because early Christians were accused of cannibalism because of saying the body and blood of Jesus that they consumed. So he's saying, no, no, they're just having bread and wine. So Pliny's letter reveals Jesus was a real person. And it also reveals Christians believed he was divine very early on. So it's not true when people claim later Christians changed this good teacher into some divine myth. In 116 AD, a Roman historian named Tacitus published his final work on the history of Rome. Tacitus fully outright hated Christians, which we hear when he wrote this. Crestus, from whom the name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, 
again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Yep, Tacitus hated Christians, but in his writings, he acknowledged there was a real person named Christ who was executed under the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, when Tiberius was, governor, was emperor of Rome. In 120 AD, a Roman historian named Suetonius completed his work on the first 12 emperors. It's the lives of the 12 Caesars is what it's called. And you might have read it in history class. I remember doing that myself. And in his chapter on the life of Emperor, Emperor Claudius, he said Claudius expelled the Jewish people from Rome because of arguments over, and his phrase was, Christus, which, is, which meant Christ. So he made the common mistake people make today when they think Christ is a last name and don't understand Christ as a title, which means the anointed one, the chosen one. And as an interesting aside, Acts 18.2 also mentions this exact expulsion of the Jewish people from Rome. It's just one more example of the events in the Bible lining up with people outside of the Bible who hated what was going on with Christians, but it's all lining up historically. The second thing is this. The church only accepted biographies or gospels that had the following conditions. A, they were written by eyewitnesses. People who witnessed Jesus on earth wrote the 27 books and letters we have in the New Testament, including the four accepted gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they wrote from around 50 AD. So Jesus was crucified and rose around like 30 some AD. They, they wrote around 50 AD to about 100 AD, so about 20 to 70 years after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. The first one probably written was 1 Thessalonians. And the last one, the Revelation, is said to have been by someone, possibly the Apostle John, probably really, in his late or mid-90s. So around 96 AD, a Christian and bishop of Rome named Clement mention eight books and letters that we have in the New Testament. He knew they existed. Clement also mentioned, so again, just a few decades later, he referenced in his writings Matthew 757 times, Luke 402 times, John 331 times, and Mark's gospel 182 times. These weren't written hundreds of years later. Polycarp, who lived from 69 to 155, and his pastor was John the Apostle. Imagine that as your pastor. That'd be pretty amazing. Mentioned, he mentioned 15 of the books and letters we have in the New Testament. Ignatius of Antioch referred to seven of these books around that same time. The point is these were not written down hundreds of years later. They were written early on by first-hand eyewitnesses. The second point is the church only accepted biographies that were consistent with the real Jesus who walked the earth. It was crucial for early Christians to share the story of Jesus who was human and divine as God who walked in the flesh because it matters that God walks in our shoes and lived the human life. There's at least 52 other biographies or gospels that exist that the church did not and does not accept. And why? Many on the grounds they describe Jesus as some superhuman figure who is not human at all, or a person who behaved in rather non-Christ-like ways. For example, there's this one called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. It was written hundreds of years later, obviously not by an eyewitness. It describes Jesus as a spoiled brat who abused his power. It tells of a time Jesus as a boy gathered with other kids by some water, molded clay into 12 sparrows, but since he did this on the Sabbath, somebody ran and told his earthly father, Joseph. Joseph ran to the spot and told Jesus he was wrong for doing work on the Sabbath. Jesus responded by clapping his hands and crying out, go, and the sparrows flew away. But another kid was not impressed. So Jesus told the boy, you will wither like a tree, and immediately the boy withered up and died. Now that doesn't sound like the Jesus we know, does it? And if it sounds like a one-off event, this gospel and other rejected ones 
that were written, again, not by eyewitnesses, but hundreds of years later, describe plenty of times Jesus would just zap people and make them drop dead. Does that sound anything like the Jesus of love and grace and mercy we know? Of course not. So the thing you see on the screen, you've probably seen it with other jokes too, this reminds me of what happens in our, daily, in our public discourse. These Gospels that were written down after all the eyewitnesses were dead, along with 50 plus other rejected ones we know, is, are exactly the type that are mentioned on the front pages of magazines when we're in the checkout line or on TV specials, often during Christmas or Easter time, or alluded to in books like The Da Vinci Code. And usually there's a headline in all these publications saying, lost books of the Bible with secret knowledge about Jesus. The church rejects these gospels to maintain control. Well, not only were these other gospels written centuries later by people who never met Jesus, I've got them in my office. You can, you can order them on Amazon. So if we're really trying to hide these things and keep them private, we're doing a pretty bad job of it. It's not like they're under some secret vault beneath the Vatican or something. The third thing, the church only accepted gospels, biographies, that were accepted by the church at large. In other words, if a book or a letter was only used in a few local congregations, it was not strong enough evidence in it being accurate. It mattered the first-hand accounts were accepted by many local congregations and ones that were spread over a wide geography. Many people accepting a book across a wide area, that was more evidence the Holy Spirit was at work in their writing. It's also why it mattered that the writing was consistent with the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. See, if a congregation accepted a biography or writing about Jesus that made sense to many people, if they accepted it as accurate and faithful and, and, and something that really described the real Jesus who walked the earth, they would study it and they would use it in worship, just like we're doing today. Otherwise, most people would reject it as not describing the Jesus who walked the earth and the Jesus we encounter through faith and the work of the Holy Spirit. That was important to them. Now, while there's lots of blogs and books and YouTube channels promoting Jesus as a myth, suggesting Jesus never lived or was highly misunderstood, at a scholarly level, the existence of Jesus of Nazareth has been firmly established even by people that don't follow him and believe that he was God walking on the earth and by non-biblical sources admitting to it. So the third thing, Jesus is one of the better attested historical figures from the first century. There's a lot about him that's written. Bringing together all this information today gives us more assurance, more confidence the stories about Jesus are true. The first week we discussed the strong evidence Jesus' tomb was empty after his burial. How even those who opposed Jesus even those who killed Jesus agreed the tomb was empty. The next week, we talked about how people died testifying to the fact that they saw Jesus walking the earth after he had died, and how not a single one of them tried to save their earthly life by saying, oh, it's not true, I just made it up. Because people will die for a lie, people will die for the truth, but rarely people die for a lie that they already know is a lie. And so these people died for something they knew was true and they saw with their own eyes. And so what we look at this week, hearing evidence Jesus was a real person and people inside and outside of the Bible documented his life, his death, his resurrection, and how his followers worshipped him early on. All of this evidence continues to build confidence the story of Jesus is true. And that's why the last note, we can live with an evidence-based faith that Jesus really lived and really died on a cross and really rose from the dead to win us eternal life. Eternally deep life here on earth that allows us to start over each and every day and eternally long life in heaven with God and our loved ones. Amen.